Hey, hello everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be with you guys today and uh, it's really nice that we can join together and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus. So I just want to encourage every one of you to join us. Feel free to sing, shout some praises to God and wherever you are, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to we're going to worship our living God. So yeah, let's start with a song uh, saying like your love is amazing, steady and changing. Uh, in the situation like everything is like so different like people are struggling a lot but like God's love is amazing it's it's still unchanging God can do miracles God can bring all the things back to normal so let's sing this song uh with a faith and with a hope that uh yeah for the future Hallelujah 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 Your love makes me sing Hallelujah 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 Your love makes me sing Your love is amazing steady and unchanging Your love is How you gently lift me when I'm surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising, I can feel it rising All the joy that growing deep inside of me Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through And I can feel this God song rising up in me Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah Your love makes me sing Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah Your love makes me sing Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah Your love makes me sing Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah Love makes me sing. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory, the King of all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you would bear my cross You'd lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings up chaos Back into order Who makes the orphan A son and daughter The king of glory The king of all kings Who rules the nation With truth and justice Shines like the sun In all of its brilliance The king of glory 
the king above all kings. This is unfailing love. This is amazing grace that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
morning and once again I greet you from the city of Istanbul. We're into the book of Ephesians and we're into chapter 5 and this morning I want to start by reading chapter 5 verse 8 to 14. So let's read together. For once you were full of darkness but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It's a shameful thing to even talk about the things that the ungodly people do. They do this in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, arise up from the dead and Christ will give you light. Last week, you'll remember, we looked at the challenge of 
imitating our Heavenly Father, walking like Him. We looked at the challenge that we have to follow the example of Jesus and to walk in love. We also looked at Paul's warning against living like idolaters. He says, those things show themselves up in immorality, impurity, greed, filthiness, silly talk, and coarse jesting. He says, you don't live like that. Walk like your heavenly father. And this morning, our scripture really speaks about walking in the light. As children of God, we want to faithfully walk in God's light. You know, in South Africa, I must admit, I hated walking in the darkness. And the main reason for that was that I hated snakes so much and I was terrified that I would come up to a snake at some stage or the other. The area we lived in had many snakes and many of those snakes were actually very dangerous, even deadly snakes. And so I was always very cautious. I've said sometimes at the church in Uti, I've said that um, I'm so glad I live in Uti where there are no snakes. And I've asked people not to tell me stories about snakes and disillusion me after the service. And normally I have a whole line of people waiting to tell me about all the snakes they've seen in Uti. Well, it was back in 1984, and I had uh, just qualified for ministry. I'd moved to a new area, and uh, I remember one evening I was going to visit some family. And uh, the last part of my drive was up a hill. It was more than a kilometer, and it was steeper than the Hebron Hill. And uh, I just got to the bottom of the hill, and my car broke down, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, eventually I decided, well, I'm going to have to walk. There's nothing I can do. It was pitch dark. You could see absolutely nothing. And I began my walk. I'd only taken a few steps when I just felt this long, heavy thing kick up onto my foot in the front part of my ankle. And I knew it had to be a snake that I kicked up to my foot. Now, I would love to say, being a young man of God, I just cursed the snake and continued to walk. Well, I didn't. I screamed louder than you could ever imagine. I think anybody in a five kilometer radius heard me scream. I screamed, God, help me. And then I broke two world records. The first one was I jumped higher than anybody has ever jumped. And at the same time, I propelled myself forward. And then I ran faster than anyone has ever ran. I got to the top of that hill in record timing. I have to say, I couldn't breathe for about two hours after I reached the top of the hill. But I hate the dark. Uh, and it's for, 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 for that very reason that I hate the dark. We live in a world where a lot of people speak about being enlightened. That's a big thing. I'm enlightened. And really, what many people speak about when they're talking about being enlightened is that they have a progressive attitude towards moral issues. Actually, the reality is they play around with sin and sinful behavior. That's what enlightenment means in our world. Pastor Joe Wright was a minister who was asked to open the Kansas House of Representatives um, meeting with prayer. And in his prayer, he described how we have changed the names of sin and we've made, given them good names that make them sound better. He says we call idolatry multiculturalism. We call perversion an alternative lifestyle. Lack of discipline, we call that in our children, we call that building self-esteem. The abuse of power, we call politics. Coveting our neighbor's possessions, we call that ambition. Profanity and pornography, they called freedom of expression. And you know, Isaiah, hundreds of years ago, already spoke of that in Isaiah 5 verse 20. He says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. This is what we're speaking about today. Walking in the light, not giving darkness new names. You know, Unfortunately, when people are walking in the darkness, they just don't get it. People actually believe they're enlightened, they're evolved, 
They just don't get the point that they're actually walking in darkness. The story is told of a lion who was very proud and decided to take a walk one day through the jungle to demonstrate his mastery over all creatures. He strutted through the jungle forest and he came upon the bear and he said, Who's the king of the jungle, bear? And the bear said, Why, of course you are, mighty lion. Then he went to the tiger and said, Who's the king of the jungle, tiger? He said, Why, you are the great lion. The next he went to the elephant and said, Who's the king of the jungle, fat elephant? The elephant immediately grabbed the lion with his trunk and spun him around a few times and then slammed him to the ground and then stepped on him a few times, picked him up, dunked him in water and threw him up against a tree. The lion staggered to his feet and said, Look, just because you don't know the answer, you don't have to get so angry. This lion was the one who wasn't getting it. He was the one who was missing the truth, like many people are today. They think they're enlightened, but they're walking in darkness. In verse 8, the first thing that we, we read in this passage in verse 8 is that we're told there is a great contrast of walking in the light. We were in absolute darkness, but now we're in the light. We can see. We were walking in darkness and stumbling around, but we no longer do that. As a matter of fact, the scripture goes beyond that, and it says we were full of darkness ourselves. That's who we were, the very people we were, and now we're full of light. We are the light. Those are powerful words. In John eight twelve, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world, but Paul says here that we are the light in the Lord. So how does that work? Well, one commentator put it this way, which I really like. He said, when Christ was in the world, he was like the shining sun. When the sun set, the moon comes up. The moon's a picture of believers in the church. The church shines, but not with its own light. It shines with reflected light. Our light doesn't originate with us. Our light comes from Christ. We reflect him. Our job, like the moon, is to reflect light. If the church is not reflecting light and the light of Jesus, then how dark is the world going to be? We're not doing our job then. This commentator goes on and makes a further observation saying, what is the only reason that the moon does not reflect the light of the sun? Well, it's in an eclipse when the earth gets in the way. And he says, likewise, we stop reflecting the light of Christ when the world blocks our way. We don't want that to happen. We want to walk in the light of Jesus. We want to radiate Jesus. There's a contrast when we're walking in the light. The second thing is, there are some characteristics of walking in the light. Verse 9 reads, For the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. The light produces fruit. And Paul mentions those things. And they're in total contrast to the six things that he mentioned last week. He first of all speaks of goodness or moral excellence. Paul uses this word in describing the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. Goodness is best described as love in action. Moral excellence, goodness. And then he says righteousness, meaning that we live in integrity with God and man. Paul told the young minister Timothy, pursue righteousness. And in John, we read in 1 John 2, 9, 29, whoever practices righteousness is born in Jesus Christ. We want to live righteous lives. We want to live with goodness. And thirdly, it speaks of truth. Truth, we've spoken about it before. It's the absence of deception, falsehood, or hypocrisy. You know, we live in a world where knowledge is constantly growing. Daniel tells us in the book of Daniel that in the last days, knowledge shall increase. We can actually barely keep up with all the growth in knowledge. The minute you get a new watch or computer or car, there's always a better model with more features. 
when the rocket Apollo 13 ran into trouble 205,000 miles away from Earth, scientists started working on that problem and they found another flight path in just 84 minutes. It's estimated if that was attempted before computers, that it would have, with just pen and paper, it would have taken 1,040,256 years to discover that. Knowledge is growing at an exponential rate. But I want to say to you this morning, truth doesn't change or get added to. It's a fruit of God's revealing light. Let me say that again. Truth doesn't change or get added to. It's a fruit of God's revealing light. These three essential characteristics of a person who is in the light is our goodness, righteousness, and truth. And that's what we need revealed in our lives. So we've looked at the contrast of walking in the light, the characteristics of walking in the light, and then there is a command to walk in the light. Verse 10, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. As children of the light, we are to produce the fruit of goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's what pleases God. And we're told to live a life that pleases God. Do you spend a lot of time contemplating how you can please God in your lifestyle? The way we please the Lord is taking no part in worthless evil deeds of darkness. Our lives have to be different from the world and the activities of the world. We live to please God, and we need to work at living to do the things that please God. The fourth thing is that there is a commission when we're walking in the light. Instead of walking in evil and darkness, it says in verse 11, instead expose them. That's the evil and the darkness. It is a shameful thing to even talk about the things that the godly, ungodly do in secret. But their intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. Don't live in darkness. Instead, expose the darkness. You know, the word that uh, it comes from expose, it means to correct, reprove, or discipline. We are to correct others' lives with living in the light. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. We're made to make a difference in the world we're living in. The church should be affecting a society and changing society. We should be bringing change. But unfortunately, too far too often, the world changes the church instead of the church changing the world. That shouldn't be the case. Notice that exposing, the exposing that we do, is not necessarily done with words. It says in verse 12, actually, it's disgraceful to even speak of these things. But you see, our lives, by living our lives in the light, we can reprove, we can correct, and we can train others to live in goodness, righteousness, and truth. And that's what we want to do. I'm told that, that uh, years ago, a number of men went golfing. There was a man who was not a Christian who went out with uh, four other, three other men. One of them was Billy Graham. And uh, at the end of the match, one of the friends asked him, well, what did you think of the Reverend Billy Graham? And he said, actually, I don't need people ramming religion down my throat like Billy Graham. The reality was, during that whole golfing match, Billy Graham didn't say anything to this man about his religious right, life or try and uh, put anything right in his life. It was just his life that spoke to this man and challenged this man. You see, when we live in the light, we expose or we correct the darkness. And that's exactly what he did. Everything becomes visible when it's exposed to the light. What effect does your life have in your workplace, your classroom, your friendship, your family? I remember when I was working uh, in one factory in Johannesburg years ago, uh, after some time, people apologized to me for swearing. I'd never corrected them when they swore. But through my life, that became a challenge to them and they were convicted. I think of the great missionary 
Henry Martin, he was looking for a translator and went to one man to ask him to become his translator. And the man said, no, I won't become your translator because I don't want to become a Christian. He said, I'm not going to try and make you a, a, a Christian. I just want you to help me with my translation work. He said back to the, uh, Henry Martin, no man can work with you and not become a Christian. What a testimony of light. Paul's ultimate point is that we hold up all things to the light of Scripture and the testimony of Christ, and they will expose the darkness. You know so well that the markets in India and even in the Middle East, the shops are all built one after the other. There's no windows on the sides. And it means that the shops are often very dark. And sometimes if you want to look at the product that you're buying, you've got to take it out into the sunshine to see what it really is and its true worth, to see if it's got flaws, to determine its value, its imperfections. And that's exactly what it is with Christian. The light of Jesus reflects on the world and it reproves the world. We need to do, we need to bring all our opinions our suggestions, our ideas, and the ways of the world, and we need to see them as they stand up to the light of Christ. Everything has to be weighed up to the light of Christ. And then finally, as I close off this morning, there is a call to walk in the light. Verse 14 says, For this reason I say it to you, awake sleeper and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is Paul's invitation to those who have been convicted by his words in these first 14 verses. Paul always has an element of grace in his message. He's not coming to condemn. He's challenging people to change. He says, let Christ shine his light on you. There are some people in the church that have more in common with the first six things that Paul mentioned we dealt with last week. Immorality, impurity greed, filthiness, silly talk, and coarse jesting than they do with the second list, goodness, righteousness, and truth. Paul is saying to them, wake up and stop dreaming that your relationship with God is right. It's not. Realize that your life has been lived in darkness and you're living among the dead. Get up out of the darkness and start reflecting Christ in your life. Walk in the light. You remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? In John 11, we read of those events. He didn't just say to Lazarus, Lazarus, come to life. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Come out of the grave. And the words to Jesus for each one of us who are not living the lives we should be living is, you don't belong in the tomb anymore. You're not the same today as you were before. Come out. He's saying, you have no business in darkness. You're a child of the light. And so I want to say to you today, live your life in the light. Let Jesus be reflected in your life every day. Everywhere you go and in all you do, let the light expose the darkness and make a difference in the world you're living in. We have been called to live in the light. We've been called to make a difference for Jesus. May the Lord not only challenge your heart, but may we change and become more like Him. The Lord bless you. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you again, and it's wonderful that we can come around the table of communion uh, and just remember what it is that Christ has done for us. And as we come around the table and we celebrate what Christ has done for us, uh, let us read this morning from Isaiah uh, 53, from verse 4 uh, to 6. It says, Surely He has borne our griefs and has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, we have turned 
uh, everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so this morning we remember Christ, we remember what he has done for us, we remember uh, that he has taken our transgressions upon himself, and that now we stand fully forgiven uh, in the presence of God. Uh, and so Christ, his body was broken for us, his blood was poured out for us, so that we might have life to the full uh, in this time that we are living in. And so uh, let us come around the table of communion and let us rejoice and with thankful hearts partake. And so let us just pray together. Father God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us in Christ. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that our sins have been forgiven. And in Christ, we have um, been given life to the full. And so, Father, we just pray, Lord, that, that you would help us, Lord, to continually remember this, uh, that we would remember the great price that Christ has paid, that, that he was wounded for our sins. And so, Father, may we live lives of true thankfulness now. May we glorify you with these lives that you have given us. And so, Father, be glorified in everything that we do. And so, Father, we just come before you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so let us partake of communion together.